We're talking about the black vote and this Washington Post poll uh, that came out that said that essentially there's been a 12 percent drop in the number of black voters who are certain that they are going to vote in the November uh, election. And also we know that the White House uh, has Kamala Harris on the road visiting cities around this country, talking to and engaging with black voters. She was in Atlanta uh, last week. So I want to ask you, Devante, first of all, thanks to both of you for joining me. Thanks for the work that you're doing on the ground, engaging voters all over this country. But uh, Devante, you're right there in Georgia. So talk to us about the vice president's visit with black entrepreneurs in uh, the state last week. How did that go over? Uh, how do people feel about her being there? And you know, did it have the intended purpose of motivating uh, black voters in the state of Georgia? Oh yeah, um, I actually had the pleasure of attending that event. Um, I feel like it was very informative. I feel like it was something that they need to keep pursuing the message on. I feel like a lot of times people get caught in this cycle um, where they believe the Biden administration, they don't do anything for us. They haven't done anything. And I don't think that's necessarily the, key, the thing. I think the problem with them is they're not doing a great job of doing what the Donald Trump and the Republican Party do. And that's put it in your face, all the wins. Um, their plan for economic development within our community is a great plan. And I feel like everybody left really energized from it. So, okay, uh, Professor Baker, one of my guests in hour one just said uh, she's a progressive Democrat. She's in New York. She said she didn't vote for Biden in the New York primary. She's not likely, she said, to vote for him uh, in November. And she says, well, you know, I'm in New York. He's going to win New York. It's an electoral college kind of play. It doesn't much matter. But it does matter if folks start electing not to vote. And, and the reason she said was that she didn't think the Biden-Harris administration was working hard enough to win over the black vote and that they took the black vote for granted. Now we hear that a lot from people, but we just heard Devante say, no, I don't think it's that they're not working. Maybe they're just not telling folks all the work they're doing. What do you think it is? Yeah, this is like the thing me and my friends talk about so much, you know, every day as we feel the pending doom of the election coming. And I think the struggle is honestly, is that Biden has had these really great ideas. You know, Build Back America is a great idea. His efforts around gun violence were really great ideas, but he didn't do the FDR thing and really connect the grassroots to grass tops. And I think the struggle is Obama had a really strong base of people who were in the grassroots. And a lot of that has dispersed and we haven't built that back. And I think we've given, you know, Papa Joe his reign to shoot on certain issues, you know what I mean? Not all those issues, he got a lot of work to do on some of them, but I think that unfortunately, the narrative hasn't caught up with where he's trying to go. And we know Donald Trump is good at narrative and we know our people love some stories. And so here we are. So, you know, one thing I think about Devante is how different today is than when Obama ran. Uh, obviously he had his challenges being the first black president. So I don't want to minimize the challenges that he faced, but the nation just wasn't nearly as divided as we are now. I mean, you think about Obama running and how he was able to bring Republicans and independents and, you know, folks together that weren't, you know, automatic bedfellows, folks who weren't necessarily in coalitions together uh, on most issues. But in this polarized, you know, environment, once it's kind of like once Donald Trump got into office, all bets are off. So I, I'm wondering if people are holding Joe Biden to a standard today that even Obama or anyone else that is so-called a younger, more dynamic, more charismatic uh, president still wouldn't be able to meet just because they're running in such a different climate. I believe so. And just um, the characteristics, I think it's a, li a lot easier to pick at a Joe Biden than it is a Barack Obama, a Joe Biden. He's, you know, got to keep it 100. He's older. He's um, not as charismatic as an Obama is. He doesn't really establish that confidence that Obama did. So I feel like it makes him a little bit easier of a target. Um, but I definitely do think he's running in a totally different atmosphere. Social media is a bigger thing right now. We're dealing with high levels of misinformation and disinformation that we didn't have to deal with during the Obama time. I feel like it was coming up, but it's nothing like it is right now. Um, he's just running in a totally different climate. He has to work a lot harder and he has a lot more 
things to come at him than Obama did. And we were more unified with Obama, I feel like, because, you know, all types of walks of light could get behind a minority president. Um, I think right now we don't see ourselves being represented in those seats. So it does allow them to divide us a little bit more and what they're doing with other issues that we represent, trying to divide us with in between each other. So um, I just think Joe Biden is just Uncle Joe. He's just a little bit, you know, bigger of a target. That's all. You know, I, I think about that, uh, Dr. Baker, because folks always say, you know, he's too old. We want somebody younger. But I think about who these younger people are, these, you know, kind of mythical people that if they were running, that would have the ability to unite the party that would speak to the issues uh, that black voters in particular say are not being spoken to. And I think back to when Joe Biden ran four years ago, when we had younger, more diverse candidates who were running and they couldn't get traction. So if you had to just kind of, you know, lay out a list like Donald Trump has all these folks auditioning to be his VP, who are the folks that you think are, are you know, would, would galvanize in this divided moment, the Democratic Party? Well, I honestly, I wish I could show you my phone because I just got off the phone with our county executive, David Crawley, a 35-year-old black man who runs uh, a million-person metro metropolitan area. And, you know, he's done an excellent job. We live in a city that's segregated, you know, wealth disparities. And he's done an amazing job. And he's been working with our mayor, Chevy Johnson. And I'm going to be what, honest. The reason why he's calling me is because I've been honestly, you know, advocating on other issues. And he checked in with me. He doesn't have to. I'm not even advocating on issues related to his jurisdiction. And so there are people all across this country. And that's the problem. I think the biggest problem. Uh, with Joe Biden. Well, there's two things. One, I think Palestine is a real issue. I think black people are peace loving people. You can't, we know a fight is there, but once it goes too far, we're not with it. And I think that's a real issue he has to deal with. And I think the other thing is, you know, the reason why we love Obama and the reason why his campaign was great is because he's a great executive. He ran a great campaign. He empowered people. He put him in positions of power. He lifted up the leaders. We knew all of the names of the people around you know, Obama. Joe Biden has not done that. And he's got well, great I'm, people. I'm going to challenge, challenge you on that because, you know, there was a lot of criticism of that Obama campaign. There was a lot of elitism, criticism of it being an elite campaign. And there were a lot of black folks who were not feeling like, you know, they were invited to the barbecue. So it's a little easier, I think, looking back to have a vision of, you know, to kind of recreate what that campaign was, but I'm, I'm thinking about in that moment, there were a lot of people who weren't, you know, who thought he was kowtowing too much to white folks. Remember oh. the big complaint that he was not a black president, that he did not respect the black vote, that he took our black vote for granted as well. So let's, let's be clear about in that moment when he was running, it wasn't all kumbaya with black folks. No, amen. And, uh, Yes, I'm not going to go on any station connected to Tavis Smiley and try to say something that's not that, for sure. But I do think he was running at a different time. And I do think my criticism of Obama was that he tried to contain the contradiction of race too long. And it exploded in 2014 with Ferguson, and it hasn't been out the bag. And he made some other fatal moves. I think that White House correspondent deal, shooting at Donald Trump, not taking the Tea Party seriously, letting Van Jones get kicked out the White House. There's a lot of, we are on the same page. But I do think at the time, he was able to unite a certain, even us at the end, a, a nation in a way that had even Jesse Jackson crying. You know what I mean? So yes and no, and I'm going to back up. But he does need to, I did, he, he needs to lift up the black women around him though, for sure. He needs to lift up the black women around him. Any any station I'm on, I'm going to say it over and over again. Without that, we don't know who's saving him. And I think that's his big issue. Yeah, I think we can agree it's complicated. But, you know, here we are, Devante. We have what we have. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to hear that you're saying, Dr. Baker, that there are some young uh, folks coming up in your jurisdiction who might, you know, be players on the national stage. You know, Wes Moore's names comes up a lot, the governor of Maryland. So there are people whose names you know, get floated around when we have this discussion, but we got to deal with the now. They may be great candidates in 28, but right now we have a real 
dilemma. We got a president that's not motivating, you know, young black voters, young voters, period, not motivating. That poll says 12 percent of black voters that voted in 20 said they are uncertain that they're going to vote in this election. So, you know, what are you seeing done, uh, you know, Kamala Harris being in Atlanta, being on this road trip, talking to black voters. What other kinds of things, Devante, do you see happening that you think can try to move people? Because it's hard to move people when they're not motivated. Oh, most definitely. Um, I think last week they started a nice push for something that I felt like they should have been pushing for, which is um, cannabis reform. I feel like that was a big thing that he ran on that people have not forgotten about. Um, three weeks ago, around, well, four weeks ago, around 420, um, we went up to DC and you would be surprised at how many people are still ready for expungement of records, people let out of federal prison for nonviolent cannabis crimes. I'm telling the Biden administration, your golden ticket is right there. Your golden ticket is right there. Just as you start expunging records and, um, uh, following up on the deal that, you said you would on cannabis that then reflects on our communities who have been heavily, heavily affected by the incarceration rates for nonviolent cannabis offen offenses. We make up around 30 percent of the population, but we make up 60 percent of the prison population. I mean, that right there is one of the biggest things I think will get people re-energized for it. And then also, too, when we do make it past this stretch, we have to continue to keep showing love to the Black community, not when it's just election time. People are catching on to that. And I think we got to keep it going every year. Yeah. No, I, I think you didn't mean to say that Black folks are 30% of America. That's that's not the... No, 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 no. no, no. I'm, I'm speaking of Georgia specifically. My bad. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we only wish. Uh, Dr. Baker, you know, that's an excellent point about the cannabis. That was great news. Uh, the relaxing of some of the regulations at the federal level around cannabis. And then, like you said, pushing in on that expunging of records. Uh, I felt the same way with the student loan debt relief. I know people are upset about it, but I know so many people have gotten letters saying that their debt has been expunged. So those are real things that, you know, impact people's lives on a day to day basis. So if you get a letter in the mail that says forty thousand dollars, which I know a guy who said he got a letter that said forty thousand dollars of his debt was wiped out. Uh, and others, uh, one woman, she's in her late 60s, had some debt wiped out. So those kinds of stories that people, you know, get those people talking about that. Uh, and showing that this is something that's important that does, because we know we've been the subject of these predatory lenders at a lot of these for-profit colleges, uh, mm -hmm. and that it has impacted our community in a significant way. Uh, so I, I think those are some of the things, obviously, the Biden administration needs to do a much better job at uh, talking about. When we come forward, I, I do want to talk about the use of Kamala Harris. And are we seeing people, Black people in particular, respond to her differently? Because we know when she was first elected, there was a lot of excitement amongst Black women, uh, a lot of, you know, kind of grumbling by some parts of our Black community, particularly Black males. And I still hear some of those grumblings, although I, I kind of think we've turned the corner. So I just want to know what the both of you are hearing on the ground. And can Kamala Harris be that secret <laughs> weapon, be that bridge uh, for those folks who think Biden is too old, he's not charismatic enough, he's not addressing their issues, you know, will they see Kamala Harris and the prospect of her being front and center, knowing in a second administration, whoever is president, after two years, they're pretty much lame duck. So it's going to give Kamala Harris a great opportunity if, you know, if there is a second term for her to really take center stage and lead on some of these issues. So let's talk about the role that our vice president is playing uh, and can play as we move into November. I want to read to both of you something uh, that came out in the news today. It said, in the 2020 Democratic primaries, Biden always had consistent Black support, while Harris never drew much. And while CNNs and other polls show Biden still has higher approval ratings among people of color and is overwhelmingly the choice against Trump, many of those same polls consistently show Trump's share of the Black vote is ticking into double digits. Many Black activists, Black Republicans, and even some administration aides <laughs> bitterly bring up Biden's 2020 line, this is his line, I tell you what if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. They bring this up as evidence that the black vote has been taken for granted. 
Now, they don't tend to remember Biden's apology, but Representative Wesley Hunt, a black Republican from Texas, has made a running theme of the quote on social media, invoking it against the president on a wide range of political hits. And Trump's allies are trying to make Biden disaffection among minorities and young voters part of the messaging. He has a new ad out from the Make American Great Again campaign. It shows a white woman making calls from what's supposed to be a Biden-Harris campaign office. She says, yeah, yeah, or somebody on the call says, yeah, yeah, I voted for Biden last time. That's what a man's voice says. That's fantastic, the woman says. Is it, he says, complaining about handouts for immigrants while he's struggling to pay his bills? Things were better before Biden. I'm voting for Trump. The ad ends with the text of a headline that reads black Hispanic young voters abandoned Biden. Now that's an ad, uh, Devante, that's playing in Georgia. Uh, they're making a play for rural Georgia voters. Uh, have you seen that ad? And even if you haven't, how effective do you think it's going to be? I have not seen the ad personally. Um, I don't think it'll be that effective. I think it's going to be effective amongst people who are already conservative. So you're black conservatives. Um, I'm really good friends with the chairman of the Young Republicans Black Caucus. And there's already this narrative that they're trying to pit uh, black people against Hispanics. They're trying to just further di the divide amongst us so that way they can rake us in more. Um, I don't think that'll hit us very hard. Um, we we I don't think it's going to be that effective. That's just me. Yes. Uh, Tim Scott, uh, Dr. Baker, you mentioned your uh, mayor there in Milwaukee, uh, Cavalier Johnson. He was asked, uh, would it impact black voters if Tim Scott is elected? Some folks think that Tim Scott could have a big, big impact on black voters, particularly maybe those black male voters who are unhappy with Biden. What do you think of Tim Scott? He was one of the ones auditioning over the weekend and is very hopeful that he'll get selected. I mean, whatever Tim Scott has to do to keep his name in the news cycle, I'm with, brother. Keep pushing, Tim Scott, you know. But at the end of the day, you know, Black people, you know, we have operate on frequency, I think. And I, I think people know the vibes of Tim Scott. And I, it's not going to be tricking anybody. I think the bigger struggle is the communication channels to young people are cut off. And the Democratic Party hasn't figured out how to communicate to young people. You know, this brother Devante should have a bigger role in the national. He should be up here in Milwaukee and Wisconsin talking to our people. You know, I think that that's their biggest challenge because, you know, they're used to doing things through email and Twitter and young people don't respond to those channels. And so I think if they really want to connect, they have to put the power in the hands of the next generation. What about that, Devante? Uh, Dr. Baker says you should be out there playing a much bigger role. You're doing a great job, obviously, in Georgia, but that he wants to see you in Milwaukee. He wants to see you in places and spaces all over this country. Dr. Baker, I appreciate that. I do agree, even if it's not me. That is the biggest thing that I've been saying, and which is why I'm making a push in August to run for president of the Young Democrats of Georgia, because I feel like our faces need to be leading the party, not just solely leading the party, but if you want us to keep voting in this way, we need to see ourselves represented. We need to see locks and tattoos, and we need to see the demographic of people that you're trying to reach in these leadership positions. So whether that's me, whether that's um, like we do down here in Georgia with the Young Black Caucus, we're training up everybody that joins us because we want you want to run for city council let's get you ready state legislator let's get you ready i agree with that sentiment can, can I add this go ahead dr baker Ariba, we need to see you too you need to come to these places straight up i'm not i'm being honest you know we need we need the energy and the vibe the party you know is operated in a certain way and the local level sometimes you're fighting against the party and think you're fighting against joe biden no you know, there are surrogates all over here that could be deployed. And one of the struggles is Hillary Clinton in 2016 didn't really run. So, yes, we need to see you here. If you come, we'll make it super fly. We'll make it, make it well, super fly for you. I, I love that invitation. And I'm agreeing with you, Dr. Baker. I get a little frustrated myself. You know, I'm, I'm a diehard in the woods for Kamala, uh, Kamala and Joe Biden. But I do get a little frustrated because I see 
lots of surrogates that you know I want to see more of, want to see them in more places. Now, I know the vice president, and maybe one of you have been invited to these dinners. She's been really trying to make a push with Black men. She's been hosting uh, these dinners, some uh, at the official VP residence in D.C., uh, the Naval Observatory, others in different locations around the country where she's been talking to folks. She went on D.L. Hughley's radio show, uh, you know, to, again, trying to appeal to Black men. So I, I know that there is an effort out there, but I, I'm just wondering, Devante, when you bring this up, when you say we need more people with locks and tattoos or whatever it is, but just more people who are representative of the Black community, what do you hear back? What, what's the pushback? If there's pushback, but what's the response? Honestly, I don't feel like I've gotten any pushback about it. I feel like people agree. Um, and now how many of those are honest feedback that they agree that I can't But are they that. doing something? Do they agree and then say, here is, you know, a ticket. I want you on the, the road for the next, you know, 10 weeks. So they just say that's a great idea and keep it pushing. I think we will see after this election cycle, because me personally, I feel like I have been, you know, the quote unquote, poster child for young black youth. I have the look that they're looking after. I'm of course somebody that you would put front lines to spread this message and all that. But what are we gonna do after election time? Are we still gonna have the same energy? Even if it's not me, is someone that looks like me gonna have this same opportunity, these same platforms awarded to them a time and time again? So I think it's just, um, we, we're gonna have to see after this, cause it's hot right now, it's sexy right now, of course. You know, they're going to put us up front. They're going to have all of us. But what are we going to do after election cycle? That's yet to be seen. But I'm concerned, Dr. Baker, because Devante is talking about August. I mean, talking yeah. about, you know, running out of time in January. Now we're sitting in May. So shouldn't a lot of this stuff already been done and in place? It should have been done. And as someone who's worked at high level, you know, nonpartisan and sort of partisan politics, they're taking too long. And, you know, what's, what's the saying? Study long, study wrong. And that's why I also had to challenge people like Devontae, I'm telling you, don't want to just be put out there or, you know, spread the word, ask for the budget. And that's why what I really love about the Jesse Jackson generation, they really had the bag men, they're out there making sure that they could do their operations. And so get the exposure, but get the bread too. Well, yeah, and that's about putting money on the streets in these communities because these nonprofit organizations, these voting rights organizations, they can't do this work without resources. You've got to have resources to hire people, to get people out on the streets and to keep you know, people motivated. And I, I do hear a complaint that a lot of the dollars uh, from the you know hundreds of millions that are being raised always end up in these kind of traditional uh, you know, the hands of these traditional strategists and hands of these traditional organizations. And we got a different challenge on our hands uh, right now. And it's a challenge that's going to require us, I think, to get outside of, of our comfort zone. And uh, that's why I applaud VP Harris. She is convenient. I know several men that have been invited to these small group sessions. And the question, though, now is the follow up. Like, OK, now you, you've had you know, black folks around the table, they told you what they want to see done, but I'm not so sure the follow-up is happening. The poll of more than 1,300 black adults finds that 62% of black Americans say they're absolutely certainly going to vote. Now, this is down from 74% in June of 2020. The 12 percentage point drop outpaces the four point drop among Americans overall. So Americans overall say they're four percent of them say they're they're not going to vote. So it's a four percent drop from June of 2020, but it's a 12 percent drop uh, amongst black folks. Uh, Dr. Baker, do you put any stock in these polls? I mean, we've seen polls be all over the place. We've seen them be absolutely positively wrong. We've seen some that were pretty on point. What do you make of this poll, though? Yeah, I looked at that and went right to the sample size. <clears throat> it was a thousand cell phones and landlines. And so that tells me uh, a lot and a little at the same time. I just think that that traditional way of sampling people is going to be difficult. We all got scammers and spammers, so we're not picking up the phone. And um, there, the other thing is, to be honest, a lot of people who pick up those phones are older people. And so older people pass away. 
and they move and, and things happen like that. And so, you know, the science of polling, the right pollster, you know, like a Celinda Lake or something like that's going to get you some different information than a USA Today poll. Um, but I pay attention because in our hometown of Wisconsin, again, Marquette has a law school poll that oftentimes is pretty right, you know, and I think that they see uh, Biden is surging. I mean, uh, sorry, Trump is surging. And I respect those numbers. And so I do think that there we do have to pay attention to some polls. No, and it's interesting you say that the Trump is surging in some of these polls. So how is it, you know, when you think about the criminal trial uh, that he's right now, Devante, sitting in every day in Manhattan, inside a criminal court, the 91 plus charges against him, uh, all of the accusations against him that would be disqualifying for any other candidate. And I, I see your Republican former lieutenant governor of Georgia has actually endorsed Joe Biden. I guess this guy, Jeff Duncan, uh, the former lieutenant governor of Georgia, just endorsed Biden uh, in a new op-ed and called on fellow Republicans to do the same. He said he uh, wrote that Trump has disqualified himself through his conduct and his character, adding, unlike Trump, I belong to the GOP my entire life. This November, I'm voting for a decent person. I disagree with on policy, but he is, you know, a person that has a moral compass. So when you hear that Trump is surging and, and we, you know, the allegations just coming out of the Manhattan court alone of him falsifying records, lying about legal fees, being legal fees when they were actually reimbursements. Why isn't any of that resonating, particularly with black voters? I mean, we care about morality. We're church going folks. We, you know, uh, I've been taught right from wrong, and we hold people accountable, sometimes a little slower than others, particularly if they're black, but we're not typically one to hold white folks, you know, to a, a lower standard or to give them a pass. So why are whatever number of black voters there are willing to give uh, Trump a pass, given all of the conduct that he's engaged in and all of the allegations, criminal allegations against him? The only thing I can think of is it's a cult like mentality. I don't I can't explain it no other way than what else does one have to do or prove to you that they are just totally unfit. What other than the fact that it's just a cult like mentality, no matter what he does, this is this is who we're riding for. And I think he's also done a you know, fantastic job of taking the, you know, page out of a few playbooks for some dictators who have learned how to do that manipulation, how to turn the media or people against the media to where they don't believe information and where they see him being attacked. And they're like, oh, that's because the deep state is attacking him. That is, you know, and it doesn't make sense to me how you can say the deep state is against somebody who is also wants a billionaire partying with these people. It just, doesn't make a lot of sense. I just think he's done a great job of taking a lot of pages out of some dictators' books to manipulate and trick people. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of mind control because Dr. Baker, I'm thinking, look, I'm a civil rights lawyer. I've dealt with so many of these issues of the violations of black folks, civil rights in our criminal justice system. I'm thinking if I'm a black man that have you know been stopped by the police, been harassed by the police, uh, I have had any negative encounter with the police, which is pretty much most black men on this planet, even people like uh, Obama. I'm mad. I'm mad that this white dude gets to walk up in the court, call judges name, call prosecutors names, get away with everything under the sun in our criminal justice system that we know if he were African-American, he would have been under the jail, you know, years ago. So rather than, you know, say I'm gonna run towards him, I would think there'd be more outrage amongst black men in particular about all of the privilege and all of the advantages that he's getting in our criminal justice system. I'm going to say from two sides of my brain, you know, one as an educated, formerly working class person. Yes, that makes so much sense to me. But as someone who also understands hip hop culture and sexism and toxic masculinity, that seems pretty fresh. You go in the courtroom and cuss the judge out and just stand outside there. Bring it, you know, and I think, unfortunately, any black Trumper I've met, I'm not talking about a black Republican. I'm talking about a black Trumper I've met. They played that role well. And so it's unfortunate. And Trump's done a great job as a master media person, sort of doing enough, bringing Kim Kardashian in, having, you know, 
Kanye West stand with them to, to sort of confuse people. But again, it's all about the budget. And that's why I really like Joe Biden, because he's sort of a transactional leader. He says, you know, don't show me what you value, show me your budget. And once you start looking at what Trump's really doing, he's never investing in people of color. So it should be about our Oh, interest. no. And, and right now he's investing in his uh, desire to stay out of prison. I mean, this whole campaign is really about not going to jail. So as much as he tries to identify with, you know, I love my mugshot and blah, blah, blah. He ain't trying to go to jail. That's the last thing he wants to do. So in his whole identify, you know, if you're going to talk about hip hop culture, where you're going to get some street cred for going to jail, that ain't what he's trying to do whatsoever. Uh, so you're right, Devontae, when you talk about mind control, uh, he definitely has done that. And a lot of folks have bought into this toxic masculinity. Uh, you mentioned Kim Kardashian, though, Dr. Baker, Devontae, Kim Kardashian was in the White House meeting with the vice president on criminal justice reform. Does she get any credit for that? You know, a lot of us thought, mm, OK, whatever. But uh, should she get some credit for having Kim in the White House? So not, you know, trying to maybe pull her away from the Trump camp? Unfortunately, because Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris is a black woman, she won't get a pass. Um, I feel like she's going to get <laughs> I don't she can walk on water. And I feel like people will still find a way to attack her, attack her, attack her, attack her. Am I a big fan of a lot of the things she did as a prosecutor or a de no, not at all. But I understand that like she had a job to do at the same time. Like she was not a criminal defense attorney. Her job was not that. But I think uh, no matter what she does, people are going to take shots at her just honestly, because I think she's a black woman. Do you think, Rob, we, we saw when she ran, and I was a big part of her campaign, I mean, trying to get Black men to support her when she was running for president was close to impossible. Do you think, though, that there has been some shift amongst Black men where they are now more receptive and, and more favorable towards the vice president? I think Black men have shifted. You know, you see a lot of Black men with their kids walking around. I think the Black men are more sophisticated than ever. And I, yeah, there's going to be some people that are always going to remember, you know, free strikes, you know, but young people are looking for leadership. And I, I feel like seeing her out there is amazing. But I also hope the Democratic Party doesn't put all that weight on her, you know, because that's not fair either. You know, they really have to run a sophisticated campaign that gets to the grassroots that really invests in people. So go have the meetings, but make sure you come out with the bag. Otherwise, we're going to have to go back to our people and explain what happened. And, you know, unfortunately, they're taking too long. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about you said that hip hop culture, you know, uh, our would be speaker or soon to be uh, speaker of King Jeffries. You know, he's straight up Brooklyn, uh, is a rapper himself, is a spoken word artist. I, I'd love to see him out in neighborhoods doing more. There's so many surrogates like him who I think will resonate uh, with black voters, black male voters, younger voters. Uh, and, and hopefully th that's why I keep doing this topic on this show is just, I think we just have to keep beating that drum over and over and over again. Uh, so proud of the work you're doing, Devante. I, I hope that you get that national uh, spotlight, that national opportunity to be out talking to young folks all over this country. And as Dr. Baker says, get that bag as well because you can't do this work without any money. And nobody's asked to do it without money. So definitely in our community, we should be getting you know, the resources that we need to do this work. Uh, we are out of time. Thanks so much to both of you. Thanks for the work that you're both doing. We will definitely continue this conversation.